Yeah, so welcome to ARC again. Uh, only three more, including this one for 2022. So uh, let's pray and then we'll, we can start. Father, we thank you. We bless you, Lord. Even as the world is increasingly going crazy around us with wars and rumours of wars, with extreme weather, with extreme human activity, with lunatic politicians in every country, with people being driven apart, Lord, and everything, we know that it's your word being fulfilled, that at all times and in every way you are sovereign over it, and nothing is happening. It is contrary to what you have said will happen and must happen before the end. We thank you that the end for us will not be disaster but eternal life. If only we stay on the narrow way and encourage each other day upon day, Lord, to be your disciples in truth, because truth is what matters not signs, not wonders, not power, not wealth, not riches, not good looks, not fame, but whether or not we love the truth and walk in it. This alone is what makes us set apart from the end. With that in mind, Lord, we pray and ask that you would not only be with us, but you would engrave into our hearts and minds and those who hear this, Lord, everything we need to know on this topic so that we can not only be saved ourselves, but be witnesses for you fruitful branches we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So uh, just before I forget, I'm not sure, Alan, did you discuss with everyone whether the new gens would do the last? Yep. And that's go? Yep. Okay. So... Not just new gens, everyone. Hi, everyone. So after today we have two more slots before the, we will not be here for the rest of the year. Coming back 17 January, I think it is, is when we can start again, if I remember right. But um, so the, the the 17th of December one, that will be our everyone sharing, whatever you guys want to make of it. So that means my last time sharing is next week, and I put on Facebook that I can pick a topic, well more the point, God can pick a topic for me, but. Since it's the last one, if you have questions, I thought of making it like a mopping up unanswered things from the air. So if you have questions, just message me. Something that's like still not quite clicking or whatever it's going around in your head or something. And if there's enough of them to make, you know, to make that decision, then I'll just put them all together and answer them to my best ability. And if there aren't enough to make a decision, I'll still answer you just the same, except personally instead of here, right? So, so if you have any questions, especially if you think they'll be of interest to other people, go ahead and ask me and I'll, maybe that's what we'll do next week. And like I say, if we don't get enough questions like that, I'll just do a regular topic, whatever God points to, and I'll answer you just the same. So our topic tonight, is another one of those that God spoke to me directly to my slight confusion because I, went, I was praying and he said to me that I had to read Galatians 2 because Galatians 2 was the topic. So I couldn't remember what Galatians 2 was about. <laughs> so I had to read it. And then as I sat down to write, everything came into view as usual, right? So I'm only sharing that because for me, if God points directly to something and says, you guys need to know this now, we shouldn't like take that lightly. It's not a tremendously difficult topic. So I think the, I think God's urgency that we look at it is because of things that are likely to happen in our society and in the churches that being clear on this will help us not, you know, will help us stay on the narrow track. So I've entitled it, Grafted into the True Jesus Vine, but not backwards under the ritual law. The alternate title that you could say is, Do I have to become Jewish to be Christian? Right? Do I have to become Jewish to be Christian? In actual fact, this was a real question that occupied most of the second century. 
the church itself wrestled with do Gentile believers first have to be circumcised and all the rest of it do, do you have to first be Jewish before you can be a disciple of Jesus can anyone guess or propose why they would why would anyone think you might need to be Jewish first <clears throat> why would being why would even the idea that you might have to be Jewish first even come up The Jews are the chosen people, right? So if you want to be chosen, maybe you need to belong to the chosen people. It's a really good answer. In actual fact, it, it encompasses, if we, you could put that as the big heading over the more specific answer. Can you think of anything else from Scripture? Yeah. The covenants. That's right. So the Scripture tells us that all of the covenants, without exception, are the property of the Jewish people. God only made covenants with the Jewish people. There are no covenants in the Bible with Gentiles. None. But in Isaiah 42, I think it is, 42 or 44, it's been a while since I looked, but in there, God says concerning Messiah, he says, it is not enough that you should be salvation only to Jacob and to Israel. Therefore, I will make you salvation to all nations, even to the ends of the earth. Right. So what God did through Isaiah is he announced that he was going to expand the boundaries of the Jewish covenant. And as we'll see tonight, if you're a Gentile believer, God has added you to who he considers to be the Jewish people. We are added, he treats us, as if we're Jewish. I'll go further and say that because of the New Covenant, that to be genuinely Christian is the definition of to be genuinely Jewish. Now, whether you were born Jewish, whether you're ethnically Jewish, or ethnically a Gentile, from God's perspective, what Chris said, perfect answer, is the definition of Jewish is the chosen people. The chosen people are those who are in covenant with God on God's terms. So on that definition means that real Christians, they are the ones who are really in covenant with God on his terms, disciples. So from God's point of view, you are the real Jewish people, whether you were born Jewish or not. The scripture says there's no longer any dividing wall, no longer Jew and Gentile, male or female, young or old. Right? The only the only division is saved and unsaved. That's all God mm -hmm. sees. Those who are in covenant with him and those who are not. In this new covenant. Can anyone tell me though why being ethnically Jewish still matters? Are we can we then say that if you come across someone who's born Jewish and what people think of as Jewish, does that still matter that your DNA goes back to Abraham? It does, because there are not just one covenant in the Bible. And how many of the covenants God made will God keep? All of them. So there are still specific promises to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that are specific to them, including bringing them back to the land, including giving them a king who will rule on the throne of David from Jerusalem, and all nations will bow down, and they will never be invaded again or live in peace forever. Right? So these are promises made specifically to the Jewish people. So... For the new covenant, God treats human beings as simply saved or not saved. It, it, God pays no attention to your culture. So whether you're Jewish doesn't mean any more to God in the new covenant than whether you're Filipino, Chinese or Lithuanian. Right? That it's the older covenants that still must be kept. That being Jewish and the genetic sense, if you like. It still matters. So the church, the original church, was mostly Jewish. Why? 
because they're covered in honours with the Jews. What can we say about the Messiah? He is Jewish. So as he, as he came and set the example of how to live, he's setting the example as a rabbi for all of his Talmudim, his students, to follow. You can call that he's showing you what the perfect Jew looks like in God's model. The perfect Jewish man is Jesus. <clears throat> Obviously, he adopts the flesh. God, he's still God himself, right? So he's, he's beyond just being a Jewish man. But that's the model he establishes for us. He shows us what the perfect, chosen Jewish man looks like, and that became known as the Christian. He is the pattern that we aspire to be conformed to. Well, none of us do, some do better than others, but none of us do it perfectly. But he is the perfect pattern. So as we'll see, there is an aspect of Jewishness that every Christian, regardless of your culture, needs to understand and incorporate. And part of the reason why the Western Church has got into such a terrible state that it has is from the 3rd or 4th century, for political reasons, the Roman Church in particular made a deliberate effort to erase any Jewishness from the Gospel and recreate simple things that you'll know, like Passover. How many Western churches do you know that celebrate Passover? Right? What do they celebrate instead? Easter. Easter. Where did Easter come from? Easter is a pagan festival that they Christianized. But it was about getting rid of Passover. They wanted the head of the church to be Italian, <laughs> a Westerner, a European, the Pope. They didn't like the idea of God being Jewish. <coughs> In the course of that, though, so much of understanding the gospel got lost because it could only be understood from a Jewish perspective. As you know, that's why we study using Midrash to reconnect with that perspective so we can get a clearer view of what the gospel actually says itself, rather than what someone wrote about it in the 5th century or the 10th century or whatever. Right. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we look and see about this question and a couple of other things that come up along the way. So firstly, I, since I entitled it Grafted into the True Jesus Vine, you better reference that. So that's your first box on page 1, Romans 11, and beginning in verse 13. Romans 11, 13. I'm talking to you Gentiles. This is Paul talking. I'm talking to you Gentiles. That's us. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. Apostle means one who is sent out. So he was sent by the church, not to Jewish people. Peter and the others gave the gospel to the Jewish people. Paul and Barnabas and Titus... They went to the Gentiles. That's why, in the, our, for us, Paul seems to be much more vocal to us because he is the one who was sent out to the, to the Gentile people. I take pride in my ministry and in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people, he means Jews, to envy and to save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If the root is holy, so are the branches. What does holy mean? Set apart to God, right? So different from the world. Set apart from the state of the world to God. Here he starts talking about trees. 
We need to keep the picture of a tree in your mind to understand this. So you may not all be gardeners, right? But if I look at a tree and I examine its roots and somehow, because I'm clever, because I wouldn't know how to do this, I'm not a gardener, but if I could say, these are lemon tree roots, what would I expect to find sticking out of the ground above it? A lemon tree. And when the lemon tree had fruit, what kind of fruit would it be? Lemons. That's what he's saying. That the nature of the fruit is determined by the tree, and the nature of the tree depends on its roots. Okay? How does that relate to the gospel? The roots of the gospel are the foundations. The roots hold the tree upright. They stop it being blown away in a storm. They keep it fixed in place. And they provide the nourishment that keeps the tree from becoming emaciated and dying. Right? The foundation of the gospel, the roots, if you think of the gospel message as a tree, what's, uh, what are the roots? If we, if we borrow this tree picture to talk about the, the gospel altogether, what would the roots be? It's the Old Testament. The Old Testament, everything God said, everything in the New Testament is already in the Old, you know that. Everything Jesus does, everything that's still even yet to happen is already in the Old Testament, it's already in the prophets. Even the book of Revelation, the whole book of Revelation is already in the prophets in the Old Testament. Revelation largely comes from Ezekiel and Daniel, a few others, right? So, if the tree is going to be real, <coughs> the roots under it have to be real. And that's why Jesus keeps saying things like, <coughs> when, he, when he, um, he says to the, the Jews that weren't listening, he says, you say you believe Moses, but you don't, because if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. He says lots of things like that, where what he's actually saying is, if you believed the foundations, really, if you, knew, if you actually knew what the foundation said, you would recognize the tree that's growing up from those roots. Everything that's happening to you, everything you see now, like the tree above ground, is what the roots said would happen. <clears throat> Everything God established as like the foundation, the root of what he was going to do is the Old Testament. Right? Including the law and the testimony. Big point. So keep that in mind and we just read on. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in amongst the others and now sharing in the nourishing sap of the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. What does he mean here? He's saying Jesus came as Messiah of the Jewish people. The root is Jewish in the Old Testament. The Jewish prophets, the Jewish patriarchs, and everything God spoke to them. The tree is Jewish. But lots of branches were broken off. What does that mean? Though Messiah came, they did not accept him. They, they did not stay in the covenant. They, they chose to leave the tree. What did God do? He, he grafted in a whole lot of branches that were not actually of that tree. You and me, Gentiles. Do you know what I mean by grafting in? You can take a lemon tree and you can, you can cut a, a branch off and cut a slot in it and you can cut a matching tip on an orange branch and push them together and the lemon tree will nurture the orange branch and you'll get a combination fruit, lots of lots of trees around that are grafted, right? So it's when you take a foreign branch or a different kind of tree and you graft it in so that the roots of that tree sustain this foreign branch. That's what 
It's a common gardening thing, right? Common horticultural thing. That's what Paul is saying here. So many natural branches, the Jewish people, rejected their own Messiah, so they were branches that left the tree. So what did God do? He took a whole lot of unnatural branches, the Gentiles, people who are outside the covenant, and he caused them to be grafted in. Now those roots are sustaining these previously foreign branches. He's talking about you and I as a branch that didn't really have a right to be in that tree, but he has caused us to be joined to the root. That's the key, joined to the root. <coughs> then he says here, do not, you do not support the root, the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in, granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. We'll mention that again in a minute. So here, the whole description, hopefully you understand the picture that he's painting, right? Of the whole of God's purpose and Christ himself. Christ describes himself as, I am the vine, you are the branches, right? So he calls, when he, in that passage in John, he calls himself a vine. Here it's a tree, it's the same idea. That he is the, the solid trunk, if you like. You know, the big part of the tree that stands upright and weathers the storm. We're just the branches that come off it. But everything, all of us are sustained by the same root. But here, in Romans, He's specifically talking about an olive tree. Does anyone know, think of Israel today. Anyone think of why olive trees might be important? <coughs> it's a symbol of Israel. The olive tree is like, you know, like a silver fern for us? Or the kiwi? So for Israelis, their main national symbol is the olive tree. The olive tree is known as the tree of life in Israel. It's considered the tree of life. It endures harshness. There are olive trees in Jerusalem that are 2,000 plus years old and still produce olives every year. So those olive trees were alive when Jesus was walking past them. Imagine that. You know? And that's, this is in the Middle East, where it doesn't rain. You know, they're incredibly tough, hardy trees that produce everything you need, food, oil. They produce all those things. The actual name of the tree is its, um, its shemen, meaning the tree of oil. Shemen, oil. <coughs> The oil of anointing for priests and for kings is olive oil. The oil that keeps the, the lamps, you know, in the temple, you had the huge lamps, the menorahs, it's olive oil that they're burning. Olive oil is the oil used for all anointing oil and all the oil in the lamps. Everything to do with temple practice that's oil is olive oil. So the olive tree for Jews is a picture of God's presence, his supply, his protection, life itself. So when God talks about you will eat from the tree of life, he, they always picture an olive tree as a symbol of that. So that's why Paul was talking about this tree that we've been grafted into as specifically an olive tree, the tree of life, whose roots are what sustain it and hold it in place. So if you were going to give the tree of life, this tree that he's talking about, a name, what name would you give it? It's Jesus, right? He's talking about Jesus. We're being grafted into, not a tree, literally, we're being grafted into Christ, the Jewish Messiah. 
we've been added. The roots are Jewish. The covenant God made with the Jewish people. The tree itself is Jewish. Originally, all the branches were Jewish. But when most of them chose to leave by rejecting the Messiah, you and I were grafted in. That's what the Jewish part of our faith needs to be understood as. The root of it, what sustains it. The tree itself, Christ, is Jewish. A people set apart, as Chris said. A chosen and holy people. Set apart for God. That he might display himself to the nations through them. That he might display himself. Even that's what Paul says there. He says, even though I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I hope that I might yet save some of my own people if they should become jealous of the salvation God is giving Gentiles. And that happened. Lots of Jewish people saw God's grace to the Gentiles and couldn't understand why their God was blessing non-Jewish people. And it allowed them to realise it's because these non-Jewish people were accepting Yeshua as Messiah that they had not had changed their mind and they got saved. So that's what Paul's talking about there, hoping that he could make his own people jealous. So before we move on from that, because that picture of the, the us being branches on a tree held up by the roots is going to be important all the way along. But before we go away from Romans 11, just a tiny reminder, that very last verse 21. If God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. It says they were broken off for unbelief. Once again, the once saved, always saved thing is nonsense. Right? It's a specific warning that if God did not spare his own covenant people when they rejected the truth, you know, if they were cut off from the tree, if they left the covenant, we are not a special case. Because Christianity can be very arrogant. One of the things that makes me grieve most is when you hear anti-Semitic, you know what I mean by anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish Christians, they go, oh, they crucified their own Messiah. Is that true? By the way, no. What does Jesus say? No one takes my life. I lay it down and I will take it up again. He says, no one takes my life. Who crucified Jesus? Jesus did. His disciples tried to stop him, remember? And he says, don't you know, all I have to do is call upon my father that once 12 legions of angels would rush to my side. Well, one angel would be more than the whole Roman army could deal with, right? Never mind 12 legions, which is about 140, 150,000 angels. But there aren't enough soldiers on the entire world that could deal with half of that. But what Jesus was saying is, I can save myself. I can not be crucified. It's not like I don't have a choice, but I don't have a choice. Why? Because my Father has spoken and I must accomplish it. This has to happen. So I, it's me. I'm crucifying me. I'm going there. I'm letting them arrest me. That's why he stood silently. He didn't try and defend himself. You know? He didn't stand there like a, trying to argue the case why they shouldn't crucify him because that would have undone everything. He had to die that day because it's Passover and he's the Passover lamb and the Passover lamb has to die and shed his blood. Right? So what grieves me most is when you get a, an arrogant kind of Christianity that looks at Jewish people as if they're either A, stupid or B, evil or C, both. The Jewish people are a picture of apostate humanity. What the Jews who reject Messiah are is a picture of the world out that door. They're not especially stupid. They're not especially evil. They are the same stupid and the same evil as every other person that rejects Messiah, regardless of your ethnicity. It's irrelevant. But because of this, these things we talked about before, 
Christianity can be almost unforgivably arrogant and pompous and talk about the Jewish people as if God no longer cares about them. It's a thing called replacement theology where it's complete garbage. But it, it proposes that because most Jewish people rejected Jesus, that God changed his mind and now, and now he now that Jesus <coughs> wasn't going to be accepted by the Jewish people, now he's just Messiah for non-Jewish people, and that the Jews are all going to hell. And that God replaced Jews with us, biblically utter, utter, utter nonsense, evil to the core, have nothing to do with it. Everything that happened is exactly what the prophet said would happen. As we've, as we've talked about Ruth coming to Boaz on the barley threshing floor, because that's the time of year it is. First fruits, the rich Jewish man taking for shelter and for himself the hopeless non-Jewish girl. He takes a Gentile bride on the barley threshing floor it's a picture of Jesus taking a Gentile bride for himself at first fruits when he's resurrected. Could do hours of study on that, but in a nutshell, nothing happened contrary to the Old Testament roots. The church being mostly Gentile is how it is supposed to be, according to the Jewish prophets. Why don't Jews understand this? Was it like just like the rest of them, they don't read their own book. Why don't the rabbis explain it to them? Question, why don't the rabbis explain to the Jewish people what the Old Testament actually says? Because they never do. They studiously avoid it. For instance, if you're a rabbi, it's forbidden. There's a curse on you if you read it from Daniel 9. So no rabbi will read Daniel 9 to a Jewish person nor will he allow a Jewish person to read it even though it's in the Torah, it's in the Tanakh why? because Daniel 9 says that Messiah will come after the temple was rebuilt and before it's destroyed again when it was written, Daniel was prophesying that the temple which had been destroyed by Babylon was going to be rebuilt no one imagined it could be rebuilt, but it was. <coughs> when the Persians came and destroyed the Babylonian Empire, the first thing that Cyrus the Great did is tell the Jews to go back, rebuild your temple, and pray for me to your God in it. But then the same Daniel who predicted it accurately that the temple would be rebuilt says in Daniel 9 that Messiah will come and die before the temple was destroyed for a second time. Jesus dies on the cross and the temple is destroyed for the second time. Whenever rabbis study Daniel 9 contrary to the rules, what do you think happens to them? What is this terrible curse that falls on them? They get saved. <laughs> because they suddenly realize what it means. It means that their own prophet said that the Messiah, the real one, had to come after the temple was rebuilt and before it was destroyed again. And they realize there's only one person that can be, and that's Jesus. The Jewish people don't understand what their own book says because the rabbis are scared to read it themselves because everything they do is to studiously avoid the one thing they don't want it to mean. They don't want it to mean that they've suffered all this persecution for 2,000 years because they made a mistake. They don't want to consider the possibility that the Christians are right. So when they read their own book, they don't really read it. They avoid so much. Anything that might hint at Jesus being Messiah, they skip around. So what they end up with is gobbledygook. 
a message they can't make any sense out of. And if you if you read anything that rabbis, I think I sent you something to know, Alec, from, yeah, it's just nonsense, right? Yeah. yeah, right. So that's all. Rabbis come up with the mountains and mountains and mountains of nonsense because they're trying to make God's word say something that it doesn't. And then they're trying to argue about how it must mean that when it plainly doesn't. And then they argue with, with each other. So you fill up libraries with the record of the arguments between, between them. It's like a mental illness, right? <coughs> so we don't want to be in that same unbelief. And he's warning us that just because they were my covenant people didn't stop me cutting them off when they refused to love the truth, when they refused to, you know, and we shouldn't imagine, we shouldn't have that arrogance that thinks that somehow Christianity is better than the Jews. No, no, no. We're all human beings and we're no, none of us are any smarter, hopefully not too many of us are any dumber, but we're all at the same risk and we have to bit take that seriously. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus says something really critical. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in 2 Timothy 2, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with them, we will also live with them. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. But if we disown him, he will also disown us. That's the same warning we just read from Romans. But then it says in verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot disown himself. I'm sure you've all read that. What does it mean? If we are faithless, what does faithless mean? It can mean one or two things or both together. So either it means if we don't believe or we stop believing, it also means that we stop doing. Remember, faith without deeds is what? Dead. So to not be in this condition, we have to both believe and be acting on that belief. Otherwise, by default, you are in this condition. You're in this condition. So we can be faithless, but it says here that even if we're faithless, he is faithful because he cannot disown himself. What does that cryptic sentence actually mean? If I say I'm going to disown myself, what do you think I'm going to do? Is that another weird thing to say? I'm going to disown myself. Are you? What are you picturing that I'm going to do? What if, what if, I know he said Prince Harry, but he's not cool, so we'll pick the other one. What's his name? <laughs> William. Thanks for that technical advisors at the back. So if Prince William was to disown himself, if he, there is a way he can do this legally, if Prince William was to disown himself, what could he do and why might he do it? When I say Prince William, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Future king. Future king, right? So you're not thinking about him as a sportsman, you're not thinking of him about his, his military career or as a husband of his wife. What jumps into your head is who he is in the royal family. It's his function. It's his place and his function. That's what Jesus means. William could abdicate. He could decide that being king is too hard on my kids, so I'm stepping down. I can disown who I am. I can disown being king. I still can still be William, but I'm going to disown my place and my function. Right? That's what Paul means about Jesus. He cannot disown himself. Why? Because of what Jesus said. Do not think I've come to take anything away from the law or the prophets. He won't add anything. He won't take anything away from the root, the foundation, the law and the prophets. 
but fulfill everything. That's what Paul means. Jesus, no matter how tough it gets on Jesus, even remember when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's sweating blood, it's so stressful, knowing what's coming. You know, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but nevertheless your will and not mine be done, right? What's he saying? I wish I hadn't said yes, but since I did say yes, there's no turning back. What you have said must be accomplished. He cannot turn back from his from who he is and what that means in the gospel. He cannot give up being the sign. So even if we're unfaithful, what will he do? He will go on fulfilling the law and the whole testimony of the prophets, whether you believe or not. Everything God spoke in the Old Testament and echoed again through Jesus and his disciples in the New Testament will happen to the level. No matter what, even if the church is down to two people, it won't make any difference to Jesus in terms of fulfilling everything. That's part of our comfort. Because he is unwavering. His faithfulness doesn't depend on ours. Again, another reason why you, the whole having faith in faith, the NAR, the Minyas thing, where you know they imagine that Jesus is somehow helpless unless we have enough faith, unless we pray enough. Or, like all those songs, right? They say, oh, let's lift up Jesus with our praise. Why? Did he fall down? You know, they teach it as if Jesus needs pumping up all the time. Why us? to accomplish anything. That's what they teach. That's rubbish. This tells you the exact opposite. That even if no one was faithful, he would still be doing it. He cannot be stopped from doing it. That's a comfort, right? <coughs> that means when we see the state of the church out the door and you think, oh my God, is there any hope left? It's the same hope as before. Why? Because our hope is not based on the church at all. This tells us that Jesus will accomplish what God has said, whether we are faithful or not. Your faithfulness only impacts where <coughs> you're going. And hopefully will have a positive impact on those listening to you or seeing you, right? But if you're faithless, if you fall away, Jesus will plow on without you to the end and finish every last thing why? he's the tree the roots under him the whole Old Testament he is the tree that grows up from those roots he is the result of those roots being in the ground and if we are grafted into him then we are part of him fulfilling everything and if we are not joined to him then we are just firewood on the side waiting to be burnt right this tells us though the law and the testimony are really important because they are the roots that are holding up the tree into which we are grafted remember our question do we have to be Jewish to be Christian do we have to become Jewish first to be Christian here's the first place to tell I'll jump ahead and tell you the answer is no definitely not but here's an easy way of understanding it since we're talking about this tree Jesus your Messiah think of him as the tree we are the branches remember I'm the vine you're the branches think of him as the big thick trunk right he's, he's joined directly to the roots we are joined through him to the roots. Where are the roots? Think of any tree. Where are the roots? Someone said it. Where? Under the ground. Under the ground. What do we call that? Buried. Right? What do we bury? When you're a human being. We stick you under the ground. What are you? Dead. 
It's where you put dead people. Right? It's not just a word play, it's just gospel. We are not called to be joined to the roots directly. We're not joined to go backwards underground and just be dead. We're not called to what can't bear fruit. Can the roots bear fruit? No. The branches can only bear fruit by being joined to the tree. The tree's what's joined to the roots. You get the benefit of the roots via the tree. You get the benefit of the Old Testament via the one who's fulfilling it. You are fruitful not because you're joined to the law and the prophets directly as if you were an Old Testament Jew. You are joined to the roots because you are joined to Messiah. It's being joined to Messiah above ground, visible, that allows you to be fruit bearing, a branch worth keeping. To go backwards and be again joined directly to the law and the prophets as if Messiah hadn't come is to be dead. To be buried again where the roots are. Think of it that way. The roots are important because they hold Jesus up. The, the Jesus that you and I know, who he caused us to know and he wants us to know, cannot be detached from those roots that never move, the law and the testimony that he says he will never change, only fulfill. So the answer to our question is no. We are not called by God to go backwards in time and become Old Testament Jewish people, trying to keep the whole law and the whole testimony as if Messiah had not come. So that's the first answer. We need to understand it a bit more, and we will, but that's the first picture you can have in your mind. We're joined to the tree, not buried with the roots. So I've said here on page two, what is a real Jew today? So we know about Saul of Tarsus, right? A zealous Pharisee. He persecuted the church. He's even there when Stephen the martyr in Acts 7. If you read, if you want to have inspiration for evangelism or to what message you could share, read Acts 7, Stephen's testimony to the oh, You might end up being stoned. That's what happened to him. But he gives a brilliant summary of the whole Jewish story up to Messiah, right? To explain to these Jewish people how Jesus is their Messiah from the from their own scripture. Right? Brilliant. But when he's been stoned to death, because they don't want to hear, they're like, stop, stop, you're hurting my ears, don't say these things, don't say these things. You know, and they pick up they say, You're a heretic, you're a heretic, and they pick up and they stone him to death, right? And it says there that there was a young man who held their cloaks and watched while they stoned Stephen to death. Who is that young man? That's Rabbi Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. So in the beginning, he's right there clapping while they're, st while they're stoning Stephen the martyr to death. You imagine that, how much mercy and grace Jesus is showing to stop that guy on the road and say, stop. Stop what you're doing. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? I'm God, the one you think you're serving. Jesus actually warns that a time will come when people will persecute you, believing that they are serving God. That's Saul to a T. He was a righteous rabbi. He really thought Christianity was just this dangerous, heretical thing. He didn't understand. He knew the law and the testimony better than anyone in the land. Right? He could recite it all. He read it, you know, it's all in his head. But it was just dead words. The word was not alive in him. He was trying to be saved by carefully observing all the ritual. You know, making, going to temple and making all the right sacrifices and all that stuff, right? Outward, outward actions to keep the law. 
God had other ideas. Right? Why would God choose someone as nasty as that? Remember the first Christians were terrified of him because he'd sent so many of them to prison and had so many killed. And now he was turning up saying, hey, I'm one of you now. Needless to say, they're a little bit suspicious and a lot afraid. Why did God choose him? I'm just saying this because, I'll tell you the bottom line, the bottom line is never write anybody off. You don't know what God does. Your worst enemy might end up being used by God as part of your salvation. Right? What did God know that those that were afraid of Saul didn't know? What's God's advantage? I haven't got one on my wrist, but what normally goes here? What does God know that, what does God have that we don't have? He's outside of time, right? He can foresee everything. What could he foresee? He could foresee that if he took Saul's blindness away, his spiritual blindness, then all of that scripture in Paul that's lying there like a big library full of dusty books that nobody reads. All the words are there, but they're all lying dead. If he could take his spiritual blindness away, he could turn all of that study that Paul had done, he could turn the lights on and make, make Saul the source of the living word. Everything he thought he understood suddenly coming to life. How does it come to life? When he suddenly understands that all of it is talking about Jesus. That's what God did to Saul. He suddenly turned the lights on so that Saul could suddenly understand that everything the prophets were saying, even the law and the sacrifices, were all pointing to this carpenter that they had crucified. That's God's advantage. <clears throat> he doesn't know, sorry, we don't know that person, if God takes, can take what's missing from them and fill it in, or what's blinding them and take that blindness away. He knows who they can be instead of what they are. Right? So it's never write anyone off completely. Sure, there are some people that get onto the very unlikely list, but you never know. So be impartial with your love, be impartial with your willingness to share, Just be impartial <coughs> because no one would have thought of evangelizing Saul of Tarsus, right? So God did it himself. So when no one else can, God still can. So never write anyone off. <coughs> all together. I've mentioned there John 16, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. Jesus' warning. Well, that's Saul to a T, right? His, his real name, his Hebrew name is Shaul of Tarsus, but he was brought up in Rome. He's a Roman citizen. So he's Jewish, but he's brought up in Rome. He's a Roman citizen. Right? So he has a Roman name. His Roman name is Paul. Paul. Actually, it's Paulus. Paulus. But we call him Paul. Right? Have you ever looked up what Paul means? What do you think his character was like when he's the great rabbi from the school of Gamaliel, the school of Hillel? He's a top student of Rabbi Gamaliel. He knows it all. Everyone respects him. He's the rabbi of rabbis, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He describes himself as this one. And he's so sure that he's serving God when he's persecuting the Christians. What kind of character do you think he had? I'll give you a clue. It shows up in the fact that in a number of the epistles, the letters, he starts off by apologising for the telling off that he had given them in a previous letter. What kind of 
temperament do you think Paul had? Well, the modern person that you know that's probably very like him is Jacob Prash. You know, the loud New York Jew? That when he gets angry, he'll yell at people and be quite scary? Paul the Apostle. He was famous for it. Other writing, other books about the early Christians said that Paul was quite scary. Right? if he lost his temper and he did lose his temper because he was so bright so brainy he saw things so clearly and then when people disobeyed and people were doing dumb stuff sometimes he went boom like then he'd have to apologise what do you think his name means? Paulus Paulus is Latin Roman right? Latin for humble small what a guy do? He got rid of Saul. He says, from now on, you're going to be Paulus. The people I'm sending to you will never know you as Saul, the arrogant, loud, rude rabbi. I'm sending you to the Gentile people as Paulus, who I've humbled. And you're going to use all that greatness between your ears as their servant. My servant for them. You see, he doesn't just change your job description, he changes your name, as he does throughout the Old Testament as well, right? So we know in Acts 9 how God struck him blind so he would appreciate that he was blind the whole time, right? And then when he gives him his sight back, he doesn't just give him his natural sight back, he gives him insight. Suddenly, as I said, all the lights come on and everything he already knew from the scripture suddenly all fell into place and he realised that he had been talking about Jesus the whole time. And as I said, his, forever after, he's not known as Saul anymore, Paulus, meaning the least, humble or modest. And, to, and that's how the Gentile world would receive him, as this great man who'd been humbled by God, made bought low. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says in verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, we're on page 2. Though I am free and belong to no one, so in other words, he's doing this out of his free will. I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under it so as to win those who are under the law. So he's talking about Jewish people, right? To those not having the law, Gentiles, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. Let's just pause there for a second. Paul is famous for saying that we are no longer slaves to the law, right? Salvation by grace through faith. But right here, he says, look what it says there. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. What's Christ's law? Is it different from God's law? What does Jesus just say? Don't think that I'm going to come and remove even the smallest part from the law of the prophets. This is really important to understand, right? And you, you won't get it straight away, but you will by the end of our time. He's not saying that the law has gone. But something has changed. So when he says, I am no longer a slave, or I'm no longer directly under the Old Testament law, but I'm not completely free of it either. Rather, I am a slave to the law of Christ, meaning the anointed one, right? So it'll get clearer what this means, but I just want you to ponder that, that he's saying, I'm not like before. I've been freed from the way in which the law impacted me as a Jew. 
but I'm not completely free of it as if the law suddenly turned to dust and blew away. <coughs> this will get clearer, as I say, as we go along. So, so as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Hence, he couldn't do any of that as the big arrogant rabbi, right? He could only do it as poor and as humble. Not our topic today, but maybe someone in the future wants to do this as a topic. It's a great topic. But when Paul's talking about, to the Jews I became as the Jews, to the Gentiles I became as the Gentiles, to the weak I became weak, and so on. In modern speak, since it's where we live, if you were giving advice to yourself about how to be a Christian in a very fruit salad world full of all different kinds of people, What's Paul's model here? What's he really saying in simple modern language? If you sit down with a Jewish person to give them the gospel, what do you have to take into account? You have to take into account they believe all things Jewish. To talk to them. You need to talk to them with, as one who understands that they believe all things Jewish. You have to start with where they are and demonstrate to them how their own, their own book inevitably brings you to Jesus as the Messiah. What about, to the weak I became weak? What does that mean? I think I told you about having to go and rescue a friend of mine who the, her husband had an affair with the bridesmaid the night of the wedding and then left the reception. No one had been able to talk to him. Did I tell you what I did? I told her to punch me. She said, well, I can't do that. She says, you must. I said, just hit me as hard as you like. Because, you know, she was, the, she was Alex's size, so there's like basically zero chance of her actually injuring me. Why did I need to do that? I, need to, I needed to show her that I was just going to come and sit where she was, where she needed to be angry, and she needed to feel like she had the right to be angry and to hit him, but he wasn't there. They could hit me instead, and then get out of the system, right? It's, we have to realize who are you sitting with? So if I'm sitting with someone who barely knows the gospel, I can't give an arc sort of explanation. I have to give a, if you're talking with a child, you need to speak in the way a child can understand, right? This is what Paul's talking about. So he stopped being the great rabbi that only spoke in $20 words. He, God humbled him so he could be, he could bring what he had, the full power of what he had, and make it accessible. Whether you were a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a king or a beggar exactly the same way that Jesus did. So that needs to be a takeaway for us. You need to pause and think about who am I with? You know, even if you know a much more detailed, bigger answer, whatever, is this person going to be able to take that in? Is the language I use appropriate for them or do I need to at least to start with? You know, dial it all down. Or can I just race in there and give them both barrels, you know? Who am I sitting with? So, not free from God's law, but under the law of Christ. Paul never says the law is not the law, nor that its meaning 
as a reflection of God's character ever changes or diminishes. You cannot understand Galatians, the whole book. You can't understand Galatians correctly without understanding that foundational fact. The whole Old Testament is God showing the nations who he is. By giving his law to the Jewish people, he was showing the lawless nations around that there is law and that there is good and that there is evil, that there's okay and there is not okay. How do you know it's not good to murder? Because of God's law. Because God said so. That's what makes it evil. Because God has defined it as evil. Why? Because it reflects his character. God hates it. Therefore, he made a law against it. The law and the testimony reveal the character of God to us. And since the character of God does not change, neither does his law, the essence of his law. Paul understood that. Paul understood that. So when you're reading Galatians, or anything by Paul, you must always remember, he's never ever suggesting that the law has changed, that God has changed, much less than anything that gone away. Let's have a look and see... The word for law in Greek is nomos, right? Nomos, law, regulation. We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians for a second, which we've read a billion times about Antichrist, what happens when Antichrist is coming. There's a part of the description of Antichrist that we need to pay particular attention to when we're thinking about this question in Galatians. So at the bottom of page 2, 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him, meaning Antichrist, back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of anomos in, in the Greek, anomos, lawlessness, is already at work. For the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So you see, truth is what separates those who live and die, not signs and wonders, not power, because it tells us Antichrist will use power, signs and wonders to deceive. So seek truth, not power, unless you're crazy. <coughs> what is Antichrist called here in every line? The man of lawlessness, a no mind no law. What might that look like? We see it in the church already. There are many antichrist spirits at work in the church already. If you get churches that are suddenly pro-abortion, that is lawlessness. Why? Because God forbids and has made his loathing of anything that harms children. It's what sent the, Babylon, the Babylonians to enslave Jerusalem. So when they started sacrificing their children to Moloch, right, to a pagan god, you can't read the Bible and not work out that God goes off like a hand grenade when you start murdering your own children. So the United States has, in the 20th century, killed more unborn children than all the people who died in all the wars in the 20th century. Massacre. How do you think God feels about that? Do you wonder why things are starting to unravel? That God, is, his temper is on the edge of exploding? But when the church starts going, oh, it's okay, God doesn't mind. It's okay, God's not really against that. What is that? 
That's taking his law and cancelling it. What about gay marriage within the church? It's taking the God's law and cancelling it. <clears throat> when you see this happening, it is the beginning of the lawless one appearing. You are seeing a foreshadowing of what will, the general state of the world will be. Lawlessness. Even cancel culture. You know what I mean by cancel culture? So anything old or traditional, and especially if it's Christian, the cancel culture movement is trying to eliminate it. They're trying to get rid of anything Christian out of our civil law. Like, the, like the, our original marriage act is taken directly from Deuteronomy. Cut and paste. Right? That's why that Larissa Wall hated it so much and had it changed to what it is now, which is completely the opposite of what the Bible says. Bit by bit by bit, the lawless one will swing the whole world to lawlessness so that the whole of society everywhere on the earth will completely abandon God's law and his standards. We don't have a choice. It's going to happen. It's written. Right? The only difference is there will be this holdout group that won't go along. <coughs> Why won't they go along? Because they're set apart, holy. Right? And they won't care. They won't care what happens to them. There's just no way. They will not sign up, even under duress. They will not wear it. You won't be able to stop it, but you can you can refuse to be part of it. That's why it's, we get persecuted, and that's why it's tribulation at the end, right? Because the pressure on you to agree with lawlessness personally will be immense. It has to be no deal, no way, no how. So if we know that the spirit of Antichrist is Contrary to the law, in fact, it's trying to it's trying to cancel the law or any love of the law. That is a huge warning sign to us. So make that a golden rule. Paul himself is saying, I'm not completely free of the law. I am subject to the law of Christ. The law is still the law. But something's changed, which we'll get to in a second. I'm not like an Old Testament Jew. I'm not like I was as Saul, the rabbi, who's running around up to the temple to kill another, you know, pull the head off another pigeon or kill another sheep or, you know. He's not doing any of that anymore. Something's changed, but he's saying that, that God's Lord, nevertheless, that he's now calling the law of Christ, he is still very much subject to him. Because, as I said, Jesus makes it clear. He is there to fulfill everything the law stands for and points to. The same with the, the, the prophets, the testimony. Which actually includes Proverbs, by the way. All of it. So, if you see anything coming, claiming to be from God, especially in the church, and it requires you to go against what God has expressly said in his law. What are you going to say about it? Even if there's signs and wonders, because that's how it will be. What if you get some great evangelist turns up and everyone he lays hands on gets well? What if he can raise the dead? What if he can make cripples leap out of their wheelchair and run races? But what he's preaching requires you to believe that something God forbade suddenly okay if it requires you to adopt a lawless position contrary to God's law what are you going to say no deal because those who survive love the truth and the truth is God's law never changes because God never changes because his law reflects his character which never changes it's not just hypothetical we're going to need this. We're already starting to need this. People are finding more and more in their workplace and things like that. It's getting real. You know? There's real pressure on you to cave in and go along with stuff that you know is anti-Christian. 
we mustn't do it. And especially when it comes into the church, and especially when Antichrist starts doing the false signs and wonders. By false signs and wonders, it doesn't mean that they're not real signs or real wonders. False means it's not the Holy Spirit. It'll be demonic power doing those healings. If you don't think that can happen, I refer you again to Johanna Michelson, her videotape. I think you've all watched that now. When she was a faith healer, till God showed her what her spirit guide really was, a horrendous demon. The occult has the power to do those things. So signs and wonders don't really mean much. In fact, a real trap. Anyhow, as I've said here, just as the Holy Spirit is grooming the real bride for the wedding, so many, many Antichrist spirits right now are grooming the apostate church to embrace lawlessness so that when the man of lawlessness appears, they will embrace do you, know the, do you know the story of the boiling the frog in the pot? You know this one? It's a well-known story, right? but frogs can regulate their temperature to their environment, right? So if you put a frog in a pot of cold water and put it on the stove with the element not too high, right? As the water gets hotter and hotter, the frog will adjust its internal temperature. And humans are the same. If you feel hot, what it is, is you, your skin can measure the difference between your internal temperature and your environment. So that's why we drink cold water. Um, sorry, that's why, back to front, that's why Indians and super hot, people in super hot countries, they drink hot drinks. Because if you want to feel less hot, warm your inside up. Your brain will think you've got cooler, even though you've made your insides hotter. Because we measure the difference between the inside temperature and the out. So the frog will make its internal temperature go up, and then it will feel cooler. But as the water gets hotter and hotter, it will keep doing that until it can't do it anymore, but by the time it gets there, the water's so hot, the frog is dying, and it loses the ability to jump out of the pot, which it should have done in the first place. That's what these Antichrist spirits are doing. They are slowly raising the temperature of the water, and the apostate church is adjusting, 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 not realizing what's happening they should jump out of the pot now. But instead, they just adjust to make themselves feel better. It's all just feelings based, right? It's just feel better. And the same thing applies. By the time they realise, if they ever realise, they will be so weak and so far from God, they won't even have the strength to jump out the pot. They'll like the frog, they'll be dead. Right? So... Those antichrist spirits we already see at work in the world, in politics, and in the church particularly. That's what they're doing. They are grooming, like the frog in the pot. They are grooming those who don't love the truth. So by the time antichrist comes, they will be so adjusted that he will seem like Jesus to them their ability to discern that he's demonic will be completely gone. Their last opportunity to jump out of the pot will have come and gone. There will be a point where they will no longer be able to even know that they should save themselves, never mind actually save themselves. You understand? Meanwhile, if you love the truth, the Holy Spirit's doing the same thing to us in the opposite direction preparing us, sanctifying us, making us ready for the wedding. Now, back to Galatians 2. With all those things in mind, we come to what Galatians 2 actually says. So all those things we've just discussed, you need to have that present to understand Galatians. Here we go. Then, after 14 years... 
I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and met privately to those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I <coughs> preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, <coughs> even though he was a Greek, a Gentile. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, who, whatever they were makes no difference to me, God does not show favouritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognised that I had been entrusted with a task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. Just as Peter had been to the circumcised Jews. For God, who was at work in Peter as the apostle to the circumcised, the Jews, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked is we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I'd been eager to do all along. After 14 years <coughs> means, from what he says in the previous chapter, so I've just given you a tiny bit there, um, in chapter 1 it says, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me to his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went into Arabia and I later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed there for just 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And I assure you before God that what I'm writing is no lie. Think about what that means. From when God opened Saul's eyes and told him what he was going to be doing, what contact did Paul have with the other apostles. Zero. If he'd turned up, they would have all run away. Remember? He's in the middle of persecuting them. He doesn't talk to any of them. Instead, he leaves Israel. He goes, into, he goes north into Syria, Damascus. He goes to Arabia for three years. And for three years, he just talks to God. Jesus teaches him in the wilderness for the same number of years as Jesus taught his own disciples face to face, three years. Why didn't Paul need, need to be, why could God teach Paul alone like that? Because the entire Old Testament is in Paul. Remember, he's the rabbi of rabbis. God doesn't need to teach him any scripture. He is the walking library, right? All God had to do was show himself through with the Holy Spirit to open his eyes. And for three years, he turned all the lights on so that Saul, now Paul, humble, understood what he'd always sort of known but never really known. It all came to life in him. It all became crystal clear enough that he could then start to share it. Then he only goes and visits the other apostles for just 15 days. Just a fortnight. And he only sees a couple of them to sort of introduce himself and say you don't have to worry about me anymore because any he would have shared everything that happened. He says, and I'm not going to compete with you. I'm off. I'm going to, God has told me to go to the Gentiles. But you you deal with the Jews, I'm going to the Gentiles, right? It's 14 years until he sees any of them again. 
he evangelizes without the other apostles for 14 years. And then he visits them again. And he brings some of his converts, including Titus, who's not a Jew. And what he's talking about and what we just read is where he's been evangelizing, some Jewish Christians, where he's evangelizing Gentiles, have been on their case saying, you can't be a Christian unless you first become a Jew. Remember our question? <coughs> you, you have to be circumcised. You have to obey the laws of Moses to be a disciple of Jesus. This is trying to live under two covenants, right? You end up like schizophrenic, like trying to be two different people. And Paul is explaining that he firmly resisted them for the sake of those he was evangelizing. So after 14 years, he comes to Jerusalem and he explains the gospel that he shares with the Gentiles to the other apostles, waiting, hoping that he's not been wasting his time, that he's not wildly off course, something he didn't realize. But he's relieved that they add nothing to what he said. They confirm that is the gospel. So this is really important about Paul. He's taught by God. So even after 14 years of faithful service, when he finally does check with the other apostles, he finds that they have the same gospel. They were taught by God as well, and it's the same gospel, even though they hadn't talked. Right? That's comforting for us as well, by the way. No one evangelized them. God himself taught them. How could that be? This is important for us in terms of our role as his witnesses. How many people do you think you can save? Easy question, right? I want an accurate answer. Zero. See if it agrees with mine. Zero. Zero. You can't save anybody. The only one that can save anybody is Messiah. So unless you're the Messiah and you haven't let us in on that secret, the answer is always zero. We are, we are his witnesses who help those he is saving understand what's happening to them. We can get, help the bride get ready. Right? He does the saving. Look at what it says in Romans 10, which is quoting <coughs> Isaiah 65. And Isaiah boldly says, I was... Page 4. I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So remember the wedding parable? Those who were invited were too busy. They were obstinate. They were like, didn't want to come. So what does he do? He just invites everyone. Anyone who wants to come can come. So he was found by people who didn't even know that they could be invited. He causes himself to be found by those who are not even seeking him. And there are millions of testimonies of Muslims and Hindus who, who get saved because God confronts them himself. No Christian talks to them. They go, have to go and find Christians to get questions answered. But Jesus reveals himself to them, himself. And they weren't even looking for him. He still does this. Why would he do that? Have a look at Jeremiah 31, straight under it, which is the new covenant. That's where you find the new covenant in the Bible. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. That's a new covenant now. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people no longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, for the least of them to the greatest. It's actually a covenant promise that God will cause himself to be known, himself, to those he foreknows will listen. We don't know who they are, so we evangelise everyone. We're impartial. Invite everyone. But those that suddenly are like, they're like, 
oh yeah, I know. I don't know why I know, but I know. Why? This. When someone really gets saved, it's because the Spirit is convicting them. God is making himself known himself. You can plant seeds. When he does that, it might be in a different town, in a different country, 20 years later, that God confronts that person himself. And all those things you said so long ago, like the word in Saul that suddenly came to life, can go ping. Right? But it's when God himself makes himself known and writes his law inwardly in them. Inwardly. Salvation is by grace, remember? An invitation which God himself does the inviting, makes possible what was otherwise not possible. So it has to be your free will. Did Jesus, sorry, did Jesus give Shaul of Tarsus a choice? He didn't. <coughs> he struck him blind. What did Paul do? <coughs> Beg for mercy. He understood Paul's in the middle of repenting. Right? It still had to be his free will choice, but you, when you read what happens, it's a choice, but there's really no choice. He had a choice. He could have stayed blind. He could have been stubborn and obstinate and ignored the fact that God the Messiah is talking to him directly, directly, face to face. He didn't have to be poor. But let's face it, what kind of person can say no when God is talking to you directly? Right? So it's still a free will choice. But you could probably argue that it nearly isn't. So that's why we don't give up on anybody because God always has that as his last resort. If they won't listen to anyone, but God foreknows that they will nevertheless be a disciple, if they can, you know, then he can step in himself and confront them on the road. Or as happens to a lot of Muslims, appear in their dreams and talk to them at night when no one else is around. Things like that. <clears throat> so we go right at the bottom of page four. Verse six there, it says, As for those who were held in the high esteem, whether, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They had added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognised that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. Paul took Titus, his convert, with him, who was Greek, not Jewish by birth. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. Let's pause there, that'll do for that. What he's saying is, after 14 years, he took the chance that he was right about how the law sat now. That we didn't have to be Jewish to be Christian. We didn't have to go back under the old covenant to become Christian. So he took Titus, who's a Gentile, never been circumcised. What does circumcision stand for? The covenant, the covenant right? So on the seventh day, of a baby's, a boy's, from his, when he's born, he's circumcised so that the whole nation would recognise that he is a Jew. He's entered into the covenant God made with Moses, you know, and with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's an outward sign of being in the, in the covenant, but it's part of Mosaic law. So Paul, for 14 years, had been saying, you don't have to be circumcised, you don't have to be Jewish. Not in those ritual ways. Circumcision that I'm talking about here is an outward sign. It's nothing to do with your inward state. So he took poor old Titus along as like the crash test dummy, I suppose, the guinea pig, <laughs> to see whether the other apostles would insist that he had to be circumcised to be counted as 
real. And that's why he says that nobody compelled him. So he's relieved to discover that the real Christians were no more interested in the Gentile having to be circumcised than he was. Confirming for him that it's God speaking. More witnesses, right? More witnesses. So this gives him assurance that the what he's been preaching really from God. So that's the first thing for us. As non-Jews, while we have to be connected to the root, it's not directly. It's via Jesus. We're branches grafted into the tree, remember? It's the tree that's connected to the roots. Jesus, our Jesus, is connected to the Jewish root. Being his disciple is what connects us to the Old Testament. The law and the prophets don't change. Jesus doesn't change. All that remains true. But we are not called by God to go underground and be connected directly to the, the law of Moses. Hence, we're not compelled to get circumcised. We don't have to go to Jerusalem every Passover if there was a temple there, which there isn't. Another sign that God has cancelled the ritual law because 60% of the ritual law has to be observed in a temple in Jerusalem, and there isn't one. So it is literally impossible to observe Mosaic law now because there's no temple. Whose idea was that? God's. So what is it that's gone? When, G when Paul says you're no longer under the <coughs> law, what does he mean? Because remember, he, he, he said there that I myself am still under it. Not under the old law, but under the law of Christ. Are you getting a hint what might have disappeared? It's just the outward ritual. It's the outward ritual that is cancelled. Why is the outward ritual cancelled? Because you have the real thing. Remember the new covenant in Jeremiah 31? God says, I'll write my law. Where did God write his law originally? On some rocks on a mountain. That's external to you, right? Then they went into the box. Then they went on the paper. It's all external to you. You hear it from out there. Right? He says, no, in the new covenant, I'm going to write my law a second time. Same law. But this time I'm going to write it in you. You are going to be the stone tablet. Your heart, your mind. I'm going to write it directly, engrave it directly into your character. I'm going to engrave my law directly. I'm going to chisel who you are inside into the shape of my law and my testimony. Sanctification. Right? The circumcision, we are still circumcised in heart. It says that in the gospel, right? That the Holy Spirit causes us to be circumcised in heart. It's the same meaning. It's a seal, a sign that you've entered into the covenant. It's a transformed heart by the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's not outwardly of the flesh anymore. So because you have the real thing, things that are just merely outward symbols that point to Messiah coming are redundant. Why? Because he came. <coughs> because he came. Let's move on to the argument between him and Peter. So remember, they didn't actually have a whole lot to do with each other face to face. Then in Galatians 2 verse 11, we get to this argument. When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. That's stern language, right? For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. 
the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So even Paul's own disciple was influenced by the Jewish-born believers. When these guys came from Jerusalem, who were still of the circumcision sect, what that fancy word means is, a reality that, that for several centuries Jewish believers themselves were very confused about whether they still needed to keep the ritual law. It took quite a long time for the Jewish believers to understand fully, just ordinary Jewish believers to understand fully, that what Paul and Peter were saying was true, that the ritual law had been made redundant by the Messiah coming. So there was tension in the early church, in the, in the Jewish-born part of the early church, between those who agreed with Paul and weren't concerned anymore with sacrificing lambs and circumcising babies, and those who thought that was still essential. And it was like conflict. Why would Paul be so angry with Peter, who, before these men came, was happy to sit and eat with his Gentile Christian brothers and treat them the same? <coughs> no prejudice, no great and small. Right? It's only when these, those who are still wanting to have people but also under the law of Moses, ritually, that they, Peter wimps out He's scared of them. And they pressure him, and he caves in. And he starts not sitting with those unclean Gentiles because they're not circumcised. You know, they're not, they might be unclean. And when he starts doing it, then even Barnabas, Paul's own disciple, caves in as well. <clears throat> Paul is livid. And an angry Paul is a scary thing, right? Why would he be so angry with Peter? What is it about Peter that makes Paul so especially angry? What did Jesus give to Paul? Uh, to Peter, sorry. What did Jesus give to Peter? Every Catholic or ex-Catholic knows the answer to this question. The keys to the kingdom. Right? Meaning, whatever Peter said was right would have God's authority. Right? as an apostle. It's not passed on to anyone else, doesn't go down to popes, that's nonsense. Peter, the person, right? So Peter's view, Peter's testimony, has special weight. So if Peter goes into error, because Jesus has made him so weighty to the church, it's not like you or I making a slip up, Peter making a slip up, is like catastrophe. So Paul, who's so particular, because he's still underneath, he's still a rabbi of rabbis, right? It's all about truth. Why would Peter have no excuse? Did I put it in here? Tell me I put it in here. Let me see. I did. Bottom of page five, you'll see Acts 10, verse 28. So, this is Peter talking. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came to you without raising any objection. He's talking to these Gentile believers who asked him to come and explain the scripture to them. Because remember, the Gentiles didn't have the Torah. They needed someone to explain what was happening to them. God was making Jesus known to them directly. But they had no Jewish background. They had no teaching or instruction. They were asking Peter, the Jew, to come to their house, which was forbidden to Jews, to, sit and to enter a Gentile house was to become unclean, right? What did, how did God teach Peter this? Remember, he has a vision of that, like a blanket, coming down, and there's all these unclean animals in it, you know, pigs and animals. 
and God says, kill and eat. And he's like, no way, no way, that's not kosher, right? That's against the laws of kashrut, the dietary laws. And God says to him, no, what I have declared clean is clean. Do not call what I have made clean unclean. And in the one breath, he cancels the kosher law for food and he he shows him that it's it's a, um, the principle in it he's to apply to people. So just like he wouldn't eat unkosher food, he wouldn't sit with unkosher people. So when he says, what I've made clean, you may not call any more unclean. So not just that pork chop, but this Gentile person who's about to knock on your door. And then it's knock, knock on the door, and then the conversation we just read happens. These Gentile people that he should have said, go away, go away, we Jews, we don't have anything to do with you. It's against our law. But God has just 10 seconds before told him that I've made them clean. How? Well, they're disciples of my son. Their sins are forgiven them. They have entered into the covenant, redeemed by his blood. The Passover lamb has died for them. The Yom Kippur scapegoat has died for them, though they are Gentiles. You may not call them unclean anymore. What I've made clean is clean. So even though under the law of Moses, you could not enter their house because they were unclean, but I've made them clean. So that law does not apply to you anymore. The law itself remains. You may not partake of anything that's unclean. All God did is he changed the list of what's unclean. There's still food that's unclean. Does anyone know what it is? All Filipinos who take note, that includes, you may not eat blood. What's that awful thing you guys like eating? Yeah. It's forbidden. It's forbidden to Christians. Okay? You may not eat blood. You may not eat any animal that's strangled. And you may not eat anything that's been sacrificed to idols. That's it. That's the whole list. But pork, shellfish, whatever, was all forbidden under the cash root laws. It's all kosher now. But this is why Paul's so angry. God did all that. And then Peter goes to Jerusalem and explains it to the other apostles. And the whole Christian world hears about it. It's Peter's testimony, so it's law. Because God, Jesus gave him the keys of the kingdom, right? And now, having done all that, and then, you know, he was happy to sit with the Gentiles, but when these guys come up that intimidated him, he flakes and he starts behaving like Jesus didn't do anything. And that, like we were still under the old law. And he starts pulling away from the Gentile believers. And going back under the influence of those who are still under Moses. That's why Paul detonates. Because Peter's testimony is so weighty. It's, he's not just a believer, he's Peter that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to. Peter repents, by the way, as he should. <coughs> but you see, what happened there, it actually keeps on happening throughout history. Page six, it's about done now. In verse 14 he says, when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Remember, it's truth, truth, truth. This is what matters. I said to Cephas, that's Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? He puts Peter on the spot. He calls Peter out about this double standard. God doesn't have a double standard. 
No way. In verse 15 he goes on, he says, We who are Jews by birth, not sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. That's a mouthful. And most people don't understand what any of that means. Right? Let's pick it apart. So he says to Peter, you and I were born Jews, but neither of us live as Jewish people live. Meaning, we are no longer slaves to the ritual law. We no longer live like the Jesus is blasting the Pharisees for. We no longer rely on just outward signs. If you want a modern example, and I, you know, I'm not one to especially pick on Catholics, but it's the view, it's a, it's an example that we all know, so you will understand it fully. But it's not unique. To so you can be the worst sinner, right? Like in practical terms, you can be a proper pig of a person. But you can, in a high Catholic church, you can go along to someone with a pointy hat and you can go into the confessional and you can confess the fact that you've just murdered someone and the priest has to forgive you and give you absolution. Right? Go out and light a candle, say a hundred Hail Marys, whatever. And then that's it, right? Clear conscience. Job done, sorted. But are you actually okay with God? What does God say about that? You just wait till you get the judgment day, son, and we'll see how much authority that ritual had. That's a ritual. That's trusting in rituals to save you. Rituals that are not based on the truth in Christ. Right? That was the problem of the circumcision group, the, the, the Judaizers, as it might say in other places. They were trusting in ritual to put you right with God, even though your inward condition was unchanged. You know, you come and make the prescribed sacrifices at the temple. You can go through the whole ritual without actually being repentant inside, right? You can go back out the door exactly as you were when you came in, but you've done all the ritual, and everyone has seen it, and they all go, oh, what a righteous guy. Oh, yes, if he, if he had sinned, surely God has forgiven him. Why? Well, he, he lit 15 candles for them. You know, and he put a thousand bucks in the collection plate. You know, in the Middle Ages, they had a price list. All sin was priced. So only rich people could afford to murder and get away with it because the price for murder was like in thousands of dollars, right? So if you could afford the money, you could be forgiven by the Pope for anything at all. You just have to have enough money. And there's a priceless, literally a priceless one. And if you couldn't afford the money, you couldn't be you couldn't get forgiveness from the church for that. It was the ritual. Was God behind that? Hell no. <coughs> That's why we had the Reformation, right? But this is what this argument is all about. Do you have it now? We have rituals in the Pentecostal church. You go to any Pentecostal church, they all follow a formula. You know, you sing the chorus 400 times inviting the Holy Spirit to come when Jesus said if two or three of you are gathered there he is among you they all follow these formulas to try and force something into being by ritual it's not lighting candles anymore but it's exactly the same it's just ritual and it's of no extra value than lighting candles or buying buying redemption by putting money in the thing. 
it's not God's, it's not the terms of his covenant. It's just dead, empty, ritual, outward appearance, outward works. The next thing to notice is people will say, oh, we're saved by grace, not works. That's a misquote. What is it saying? Works of the law. Understanding this hangs on what do works of the law mean. In the original language, it literally means the action that the law requires. So he's talking about ritual. He's talking about outward behavior, outward, um, yeah, all outward activity that the law requires. And if you just do it, do the activity, you know, sacrifice the goat or say your 65 Hail Mary, or whatever it is, he's saying that we are not justified by this kind of activity because it doesn't take the sin away. Only one thing takes the sin away. Confession to God, which just means you acknowledging your sin. Repentance, turning back to his way. And trusting, therefore, that you are forgiven and that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. That's the law of Christ. But the whole law of Christ is based on everything the law of Moses teaches us about God. The only part of the law that's removed is the dead ritual. Because the ritual is only teaching us about Messiah who would come. But now you have the Messiah. And I can't remember where I put it in him. I know I wrote it, but I won't look for it. But imagine we're at, imagine we're joined the parachute regiment. So we have to learn how to parachute, right? So everybody gets a toy parachute. So you can take it home. You ever had a toy parachute with a little plastic soldier underneath, right? So you can take it home and you can chuck it in the air and see how it works. So you can learn all about parachutes with your toy training parachute, right? And then they put you on a plane with a real parachute, but you've still got the toy parachute in your pocket. And now they say, okay, it's time to jump out of the plane. Which parachute would you rely on? The toy training one that taught you about parachutes or the actual parachute? So people who go back to rely on the ritual of the mosaic or the ritual are going back trying to use the training aid in place of the actual parachute. The law is our schoolmaster. It teaches us about Jesus. But the law itself is like the toy parachute. The toy parachute is great as a teaching aid. But you wouldn't jump out of the plane with it, would you? Just picture it, you know, <laughs> holding on to the plastic soldier, looking at it. At the parachute, yep, yeah, it's fully deployed. It should be on the ground any second now, bang. You know? Only a complete idiot would do that. And that's Paul's argument. The rituals of the law were to teach us about God, his character, and Messiah who was to come. The law itself remains. You shall not steal. You shall not kill. You shall not covet your neighbor's possessions. You know, you should not give false testimony, etc., etc. No divorce, no killing babies, etc. Right? But all the ritual for the temple was for the temple when the temple was gone. All the stuff that's mere outward appearance. Why did it have to be repeated all the time? All those sacrifices. So that every generation learned it, because it's a teaching tool. They didn't understand it was a teaching tool all the time. But you had to keep doing it so that every generation relearned it until Messiah himself came. Right? So the training aid is handed on continually until the real deal, until the real parachute's handed out.
go to the last page. So verse 17 where it says, But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. Then I'll lose most people. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. That's in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Back to our example, if I could be saved by holding on to the toy parachute, there wouldn't have been any point in handing out the real one. That's what he's saying. The law was to teach us. If we could be saved by keeping it, there would be no point in Messiah coming. We, he would have just said, keep the law. But no one can keep the law. If Messiah didn't come, no one would be saved. Zero. Right? The law remains. But it's to teach us about God and Messiah. The law is not going anywhere. Jesus promised not to remove any of it. Why? Because it's the whole truth that we have to know to understand him. To know the difference between right and wrong. What does God love? What does God hate? What does he require? Not the ritual. Because now the law is going to be written in us. What did he just say? Christ in me. I died. But now I live by him being alive in me. The word of God in me. Not just me carrying out external, you know, outward um, rituals that I can do even if inwardly I'm far from God. Anyone can light a candle. Anyone can go into the confession booth, confess anything and walk out knowing that now no one can touch me. That might not make sense to you in the modern age, but originally you were, you were handed um, what are they called? Got out of my head now. You're handed a piece of paper. Absolution was written. You held it as a legal document. So if you murdered somebody and then you went and you paid the money and the bishop absolved you, you got a legal piece of paper. Because remember, you were in the Holy Roman Empire, so the Pope had more power than the Emperor. So if the bishop gave you absolution, you could walk around free as a bird, and if anyone tried to harm you because you murdered that person, the Vatican would have them arrested and killed for defying their absolution of you. So there was no justice for the poor. Rich men could do as they pleased, pay the money, and then get a legal document that protected them from any kind of retribution because people knew that if they tried getting their own vengeance, the entire Holy Roman Empire, the entire unholy Roman Empire would land on them. Rituals, any fool can do. The law of Christ in you requires Christ to be in you. Those rituals cannot save meaningless to God. He cannot be bribed, remember? He's impartial. He's told us what to do to be forgiven. He's told us what to do to be saved. If we go back to rely on something other than that, it's on your own head. But he's impartial. He's already said, no, no, nothing else has any weight with me. The narrow way. We can see this in the first epistle of John, 1 John 1, verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship him, with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. That's what I was just talking about. 
We can claim to have fellowship. We can claim to be Christian. But if our walk is in darkness, if we are not guided by Christ in us, the law written on our hearts and minds, if we're just role-playing Christian, but inwardly on something completely opposite, it's just what he says here. We lie and do not live out the truth. That pantomime is worthless at the judgment. But verse 7 he says, But if, so you know the dreaded if means it's conditional, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, light of what? What does light do? Anyone been camping out in the bush late at night when there's no moon? What colour is it? It's, mono, it's monotone, right? It's all black. Way out in the country, when there's no street lights and the moon's not up, it is as black as black as black. How can you find your way? What do you need? You need a source of light. Without the light, you cannot find your way in the dark. What torch did God give us? The word of God. Walking in the light means walking in the instruction of the scripture. Walking in Christ, who is the word, is walking in the instruction of the scripture. Does that make sense? As he role modeled for us as the perfect Jewish man, connected to the roots. You know, in Sunday school you tell kids, if you're not sure what to do, think, what would Jesus do? Do that. But that's the five-year-old version of what I just said. Walk, walk in his reflection. The more scripture you know and understand, the more you know him, because he is the word. You know, the word that's not going anywhere. He's not removing any of it or any, adding anything to it. He's just fulfilling it. And even if we're unfaithful, remember, he cannot betray himself. He cannot stop being Messiah cannot stop fulfilling every last part of it. So why fight that? Be his to go with it. What else do we need to know here? Oh, just to repeat what verse 7 said that I didn't say, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, that's important, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from how much sin? All sin. One sacrifice, once for all. Once for all. So do we have to be Jewish, as in going back under the Mosaic Covenant? No, because that's all to do with ritual and trying to be justified by slaughtering goats and pigeons and, you know, all that stuff. So whether it's the Jewish version or the Catholic version or the Pentecostal version where you come and you go through a ritual every Sunday. No. Worthless because it's only about outward appearance being an actor and a pantomime. All that matters is are you his Remember how Jesus says, you have to, my body's real food, you have to eat me? You have to take he, what he is, the word, inwardly. The law of God must be in you. It must be the software running you from inside, not the competing software that's competing with you from outside, not just external rules, internal rules. When the internal rules in you are as far as you can make it, his word. And you walk in it. So remember, faith without deeds is dead. So not just the right software, the software has to be running. Right? So the actions should reflect, obviously when none of us are going to get it perfectly right, but the big difference between a person who's making an effort to be led from within by Christ within, the word of God within. There's a huge difference in that person's character 
than someone who isn't bothering, even though that person is not getting it 100% right. Remember, it's not about perfection, it's been about being found still on that walk when he calls you, whether that's your natural death or Jesus returning. Right? The last part, I'll put this away now, the last part is simply, why would God, I have to think about, why would God want us to be so aware of this now. And as usually happens, you know, God sends me hints by stuff that happens around me. So the crazier that NAR and all the apostate church stuff gets, there's been a trend for people to run away from anything supernatural in the church. People are leaving a lot of those holy roller on the ground places but as we've spoken about a lot when people are fleeing from what's wrong they often flee blindly and there's a temptation to just run to the opposite so there's been quite a revival in people going to reform churches who don't believe in the Holy Spirit doing anything they're cessationists right which is completely unbiblical so they only want church to be nice and safe where you follow the rituals and it's all very polite and there's nothing supernatural is allowed to happen. So as to make sure that no antichrist spirit could come in because you don't meet any spirit. But it feels safe because there's no longer that mad stuff happening. Right? It's a trap. There's a temptation to find safety back on ritual. Back in, we, I don't have to be very heavily engaged. I can just turn up and go through the motions and not risk like I did before when I got hurt in the crazy church, right? I think that's what the warning is. I think it's a narrow way warning. That we must be careful not to make the same mistake of thinking that, that God wants us to just go back to anything. Definitely not back under just ritual, even modern ritual where we think that we can just perform outward signs, whatever that might be in a different denomination, and that will be enough. We have to stay on the narrow way, and even if the crowd are rushing backwards and forwards like crazy people, and they will be, to pay no attention as far as our own walk goes. Like Paul, once God had taught us we don't let anybody unteach us. That's why I was so mad with Peter, remember? Peter, God showed you. What are you doing? I think that's what God is wanting us to get. He showed us the narrow way. He showed us not to go back to anybody's church tradition, just to walk in his word in the covenant on his terms even if are all around us there's people slipping and sliding and going all over we should be trying to grab as many as possible and get them back on solid ground but first and foremost we must make sure that our footprints are found on that narrow way our footprints should be landing in his footprints who went ahead of us as far as it's up to us. Because we're no use to anybody else if we allow ourselves. What use would Peter have been if God did not correct him through Paul? He would have sent the whole church in a group U-turn back to uselessness. We must be on guard against that. And the same one thing we have to be especially aware of 
So when by the Spirit of God the Hebrew Roots movement began, where people realised that the Gospel is Jewish, that the Roots are Jewish and the tree is Jewish, that we needed to understand the Gospel as the Jewish audience it was given to understood it. Satan did not want that to happen. So what did he do? He sent the circumcision group again. And the Hebrew Roots movement is in a mess now, even in Israel. Because once again, people made the same mistake. And they said, oh, you know, um, in our church, like, we don't eat pork. Why? Well, it's against the Mosaic law. Are you under the law of Moses? But it says, it's, yeah, I know, but what God has called clean, you're not allowed to call unclean. He, Satan has done the same thing to people who are about to be saved, who are about to reconnect with the roots. But he convinced them to get buried with the roots and go back under the ritual law and be bound up with a whole lot of endless regulation. So you should understand what Passover is, but you don't have to slavishly do an entire Passover Seder. You need to do what Jesus says. When you do these things, do it in remembrance of me. You need to understand what is Passover about. What does it teach us about Messiah? What does it mean for us as Christians? And we should have at least communion. Or you can have a whole Passover meal if you like, but you must never require it. You must never say to someone, you're not really a Christian unless you do a whole Passover meal. Why? Because it's just a shadow of Messiah who is to come. It's a teaching tool. Should we do it every year? Yes, it's a commandment. Do this throughout your generations. But how you do it should be to satisfy the law of Christ so that whatever you do ends up revealing Jesus as the Passover lamb. The Passover is fulfilled. Things like that. Let's never let ourselves slide back and end up to where we would be as if Jesus was still coming and hadn't come yet. Every bit as much as we must be 1,000% on guard against whatever tries to introduce lawlessness as if the law was cancelled. So if someone comes and says to you, oh no, all that Old Testament stuff, that's a law, none of that applies anymore. False, false, false. What, you can murder now, can you? Can you steal now? God doesn't mind. The funny thing is, they'll say, oh no, you're not allowed to murder, you're not allowed to steal. Well wait, that's part of the same law that you're busily cancelling when you approve of same-sex marriage or when you approve of abortion or when you approve of whatever. You can't cherry pick which bits of the law you want to keep and which not. So be on guard. Don't buy into any of that garbage. And that's why he's warned us. Because for sure, what's coming is going to be disruptive, to say the least. You can see it in everything happening in the world, from economics, politics, wars, environment. If anyone imagines that the world's just going back to how it was, they should stop taking drugs, honestly. We must make ourselves ready to be his witnesses in the midst of a very different world than we grew up in. Nevertheless, we know who wins, right? What does it say? Even if we're unfaithful, he is faithful. He cannot stop being himself. So we have a choice. You're going to be on his team and end where he ends in victory in the kingdom to come. Or you're going to let yourself be intimidated by those who want to either drag you back under the law or drag you to lawlessness. Both things are deadly. We have to have the courage to do the old speak to the hand, 
know it's a complete sentence. You know? <coughs> no. Stay on the narrow way, even if they are, even if you think you're the only one on it. There's always a remnant. So with that, we will finish and we thank you, Father. Lord, please make these things yet more clear when people read back. A topic, Lord, that people have really, really understood for thousand, two thousand years that people have been arguing, Lord, and yet it's not that difficult, really. But open our eyes and inscribe it on our hearts. And moreover, Lord, please sanctify us by your word. Dwell in us, anoint us, so that we can be transformed, Lord to the witnesses you need, make us perfect for the days ahead, so that our lives are not in vain, so that we can be fruitful branches, joined to the Jewish roots through the Jewish Messiah, so that we can be free of the law, but not free of the law of Christ, that we can <coughs> not be lawless, but not be slaves so that we can be willing partners in your, your good and holy purpose, we pray. Not only for ourselves, but for all those on the face of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's it. For now, shalom. See you next time.